David Baldacci is back with another thriller featuring the 620 man, Travis Devine. I'll talk with him about The Edge, so stay with us. Hi, I'm Dan Skinner, and this is Some Books Considered. I requested and was provided with a copy of the book, but this video is not sponsored. A bit about the author. David Baldacci is a global number one best-selling author with 150 million copies sold worldwide. His works have been adapted for both feature film and television. Baldacci is also the co-founder, along with his wife, of the Wish You Well Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting literacy across America. And we'll learn more about that later, but first, we'll talk about his latest novel, The Edge. David, welcome to the program. Thank you, it's great to be back. Well, this is the second novel to feature the 620 man, Travis Devine. For those who may not be familiar with the character, tell us about him. So Travis Devine was an army ranger and he spent well over a decade in the army, um, served well, valiantly, was wounded in, in combat. And then something happened over there that uh, made him leave the army uh, under a black cloud. Um, he's felt sort of guilt and, and sort of he's having to do penance for this act that happened during the army. He got his MBA. He worked in Wall Street for a little while in the 620 man. That's where he met him. He hated that life. But again, it was a penance for what happened in the army, which he wanted to stay in the army his entire career, but he couldn't. And he got an ultimatum from a guy named Emerson Campbell, who runs this little agency under Department of Homeland Security that we know what happened in the army. You can either go to Fort Leavenworth and spend a little rest of your life there, or you can come and work for me. So he decided to go work for Emerson Campbell. Um, and that's what happened in the 620 man. And in the edge, um, he's been dropped into coastal Maine to figure out what happened to a CIA operative up there, Jenny Silkwell, who was murdered there. It was her hometown, but he's got to figure out was she murdered because of her CIA background, that they learned secrets from her that we need to be worried about, or was it having something to do with her hometown. So he's dropped in there and he's got to try to figure this out. Mm -hmm. And an interesting cast of characters in this hometown, a small town that doesn't take well to strangers. No, I mean, it's a, it's a very hard scrabble place. It's isolated. It's rugged. Um, there aren't many people who live there. The police department only has two officers. Um, they don't really like strangers coming in, getting involved in their business and telling them, you know, what they're supposed to do. And certainly are very suspicious of anybody from the federal government. So it's hard for him. So he's got to he's got to make his way. He's got to talk to people. He's got to learn things. He's you know, he runs in a lot of obstacles and opposition. But here is where he doesn't can't use his, his physical strength and all that. He's got to use his mental game. Uh, and try to, you know, get in these people's heads and hearts and figure out what they're doing, try to become friendly with them, try to learn things. Um, so it's it's a challenge for him, but that's what I wanted for him. You know, I didn't want this to be easy, and it's certainly not for him. Now, he's a very observant character. He meticulously takes in his environment, you know, takes in the uh, the risk assessment. Uh, he's, you know, physically able to control his mind to stay cool and all that. But yet at the same time, emotionally, sometimes he's still struggling to kind of keep that under control. And underneath all this tough guy exterior, there's actually someone who really cares underneath. I wanted that fragility to go, come come out in this novel. Um, and the people that he meets, one, one woman in particular who's suffering her own demons, um, he becomes close to. I didn't look, I didn't want him to just be this big badass guy coming in and kicks everybody's butt. Um, cause that's not really who he is. Yes. He can defend himself. He's trained to do that. And he has his physicality about him. But there was one scene early on in the book where he, he could have beaten up a bunch of guys, but he decided not to because he knew that he would win. So why harm them? And if he didn't have to harm them and that was a telling moment for him because that's the sort of person he is he would much rather walk away from a fight than have to engage in a fight because never nobody ever knows how a fight's going to turn out no matter how good you are you could be injured or killed um but i wanted him to see the, the other side of this guy he is very thoughtful um he does have feelings he has emotions he can, is concerned about people he's a, he is a caring person um and that comes through in this novel as a lot you know a number of people in this town they need help uh, they're going through some rough times and he's trying to be there for them. At the same time, he's trying to figure out what happened to this young woman. He's also trying to be a friend to some of these people, too. And I thought that was important to show because, you know, th having this big, you know, war machine come in, that gets tired after a while. I needed to show he's a human being. I needed to show that. Yeah, I want to ask you a little bit more about this setting because Maine almost becomes a character 
into itself. Obviously, you did a lot of research about Maine, and Maine is facing a lot of issues that you talk about in this book. Everything from a drug addiction, which is a problem that we see all across the United States, but economic issues, climate issues, et cetera. Tell us a little bit more about that research you did for the book. Yeah, so I, I over the years, I've been all over Maine. I've been from the south to the north, the east to the west, um, everywhere from, you know, below Portland, Agunquit and Wales, all the way up to Fort Kent and Madawaska. My, my cousin, John Baldacci, was governor of Maine for a couple of terms. So I know a lot about Maine. Um, and I've always been fascinated by the beauty of the place and also the isolation. You know, 90% of Maine is still forested. Nobody lives there. Uh, the coastline is longer than California's. It's very rugged in places. Once you start getting away from the southern part of it, um, you know, the elevation goes up, the ruggedness goes up. It's, you know, it's not a place to live for the faint hearted. It's, it's tough to survive in those places. And you're right. It is, was a character in the novel. I wanted people to feel the ocean spray. I wanted them to feel the bitter cold. I wanted them to feel, you know, the topography in their bones. Um, and it was a difficult place for divine to navigate through too, because there were so many different elements to it. Um, so I obviously harken back to my experiences going through Maine and, and being in parts of it, um, to build this story. Uh, and I did have to go and learn more about lobster fishing uh, for the purposes of writing this novel, um, which I found fascinating as well. And what's happened because of climate change with some of the other fish, the cod and the shrimp that have fled to points north because of the, of the rising temperatures in the water in the Gulf of Maine. So there are a lot of issues up there that they're going to have to deal with. Um, economically, they have a lot of challenges as well. Um, you know, they don't have a, a huge metropolis. There's no New York City, you know, in the middle of Maine anywhere. They have some larger towns. For the most part, it's small towns or just, you know, just small groups of people living in different places. Um, so it was a fascinating place. I've written other books in Maine, but I've never dealt as deeply into sort of what Maine is or represents for me as I have in The Edge. And uh, it was fascinating, fascinating trip for me to take. Well, without giving away too much of the plot, there's another character who's dealing with a trauma in their life. And the character has this condition where they cannot remember what happened. So you, it deals in the, it's, you know, it's part of the plot line, obviously, but it's something that because you spent so much time on it, it's felt like this is something you wanted to share with the public that this condition really does exist. Yeah, it does. And, you know, when people have suffered a traumatic injury like that, the brain uh, reacts differently. Um, and sometimes it, it gives like an um, amnesia component to the whole thing. It's like, you know what, it's like the drug they give you when you go in and get a colonoscopy. You don't remember anything about that. So they just give you the drug that takes away any memory that you might have about it. Um, but the brain does that too, because it feels the brain is thinking it's helping you um, by not allowing you to remember these terrible details that could send you into a, a, down, a downward spiral mentally. The problem with that is if it's a, it was a crime and you can't remember what happened, there's no way you can help the police figure out who did it and they can go and capture the person to make sure they, they're punished for it. So with this young woman, it has stopped her life completely. You know, she can't move forward. She can't move back. She's stuck in a limbo because she feels one, this void of this thing that happened to her and she can't remember. And she feels great guilt for not being able to remember it. And she's also fearful because she doesn't know who did this to her. And she's afraid that person might be lurking around the corner. So she is just frozen in time. And Travis Devine befriends her, uh, understands uh, to the extent that he can what she's going through and tries to help her again to the extent that he can as a layperson with not any type of psychological training, um, just trying to be there for her. So she really was a, a, a way for me to show this softer side of Devine that he's not just about beating people up or figuring out who killed somebody. He's a, he can be a friend, you know, he can be a helpmate to someone. Uh, in an emotional sort of, you know, bellwether that, you know, I'm there for you. Um, and that was a, I think they had a really, a really interesting relationship in the novel. And I think it was a, a big part of the book. And I think it lifted it beyond just being sort of an action packed mystery thriller. Another thing I found interesting was the juxtaposition between some of the architecture in this book. You've got uh, places that are really run down and obviously way past their prime. And also you also have these mansions that uh, represent different things in the book. Yeah. And, and, there are, and there are places just like that in Maine. There are places like that everywhere. Um, you have these, these beautiful areas uh, that are rugged and isolated. You can be private and away from everybody. Well, that's going to attract money. That's going to attract people who can you know, afford to put up these 
incredible mansions on the water because everybody wants ocean views and ocean access, right? But at the same time, you know, it's it's sort of the push pull across America. Wherever you have money, um, and people can put it these places, what what are the what do money people want? Well, they want services. They want people to be able to work for them. You know, housekeepers and landscapers and all that stuff. So these people who lived in these areas their whole lives and not not affluent circumstances who have to work for a living, then they are there to serve these people as well. So it's this gilded age, rich, poor divide uh, that we see throughout this country. And Maine certainly has its share of that. I mean, Maine relies on tourism, you know, in addition to lobster fishing and other types of aquatic life. But tourism drives that state and tourism is money. And when you go up through Maine, coastal Maine, you go up to, you know, Gunquit and Kenny Bunkport and Bar Harbor, and you look at some of the places on the water there, I mean, those places are absolutely incredible mansions. But you have to also realize that it takes people who, you know, work nine to five, paycheck to paycheck to actually keep those places up. Um, and that's, you know, that's the rich, poor divide up there. That's the clash. You know, they come together every day because the rich require those services and the poor requires the paycheck. Well, Congratulations on getting this novel out there. I have to ask, what's next for you? You have so many characters you could dip into. Where are you going next? Next is going to be a very different uh, different version of me. I, um, a book that comes out in April is called A Calamity of Souls. Um, I've been working on this novel for about 15 years, and I've sort of poured my heart and soul into it. It's set in 1968. It's a courtroom drama in Virginia. Um I set this book aside many times, not thinking it was relevant anymore. And then I realized that a lot of what I'd written, if I didn't tell you it was 1968, you would just assume it was a contemporary novel. Um, and I thought with that, it's probably still relevant. So um, if I'm if I'm going to be remembered for anything, it'll be for this book, I think. I'm excited about it. Uh, it was a long time coming. A lot of it is very autobiographical. And it paints sort of my philosophy of life in the world in this country on the pages and uh, we'll see how it goes. I'm curious when you're not writing, what do you like to read? Yeah. So I read everything. Um, I leave, I read fiction, commercial fiction, literary fiction, nonfiction biographies. I'm reading a book on the, on, on the underworld, not the mafia underworld, but underneath the seas, the ocean by Susan Casey. It's called the underworld. I'm fascinated by it. We know more about the planet Mars than we do about the Pacific ocean. Um, and stuff like that fascinates me. Um, so I'm always reading something. I'm usually reading multiple books. I'm back. I'm reading um, Walter Mosley's um, 30th anniversary edition of Devil in a Blue Dress, you know, the Easy Rollins series. And um, I just love good stories. And I love learning things that I didn't know before. So uh, for me, opening a book is opening just a new discovery in life. And I wish more people did it. <laughs> Uh, well, before we wrap up this interview, I want to give you a chance to tell us about the, the Wish You Well Foundation and the other work that you're doing. So my wife and I founded the foundation about 23 years ago. We fund literacy organizations and efforts across the country. We have probably put, uh, given out more money in the last three years than we have in the last 10, just because of the pandemic. A lot of the funding for these operations dried up. Um, we poured millions of dollars into this effort. I don't think people realize that most of the social ills we have as a country, hunger, poverty, homelessness, crime, are tied to low literacy skills. Why? Because that limits the potential you're going to have economically and emotionally and mentally and intellectually. Um, so if your literacy challenge is a parent, so your kids are going to be. They're going to have lots of problems associated with that that um, brings a lot of ill effects to society as a whole. If everybody read consistently at a high level, most of the social ills we have as a country would totally disappear, and yet we spend very little money on that. Another project you're involved with is uh, Feeding Body and Mind. Tell us a bit about it. So we've partnered with um, uh, Feeding America, which runs all the nation's food banks. They have this huge pipeline of distribution. So when I go out on book tours, my fans donate new and gently used books, and we pay to have those books shipped to local area food banks. So people going in seeking food assistance, almost all of them are also literacy challenged as well. They get the food they need to survive, but they also get books they can bring home, books for themselves, books for their kids. You start getting books in the homes, positive things happen. Um, the problem is when you have no books in a the home, then a lot of bad things happen. This latest novel is The Edge by David Baldacci. David, thank you for talking with me today. Same here. I always enjoy it very much. Thank you. If you'd like to get a copy of The Edge by David Baldacci, I've placed a link for you in the description below. 
And if you'd like to see more videos about books and their authors on a wide variety of topics, be sure to like, subscribe, and click on the bell to be notified about future programs. I'm Dan Skinner. Thank you for watching this edition of Some Books Considered.